All right, everybody. So <clears throat> this is our lecture on the Texas legislature. So this is our first lecture in a series of three that will cover uh, the big three branches of government, the legislature, the judiciary, and the executive. Um, so to start out with, <clears throat> we're going to look at the Texas legislature and how it's different uh, from other states and from our federal legislature, uh, talk about some of the qualifications to serve, uh, some of the problems with our legislature, things like that. So just to start us off, <clears throat> our legislature here in Texas is bicameral. And by bicameral, we mean it. there's two houses. We have the House of Representatives and we have the Senate. And this is structured just like the federal government. Now, for our state, <clears throat> our, branch, our two houses of, of the legislature are actually relatively small when you think about how big Texas is. Uh, Texas, the Texas House only has 150 members, and the Texas Senate only has 31 members. And this is representing a state of 35 million, close to 40 million pretty soon. Uh, so compared to other states, our legislature is relatively small. Uh, the House is said to be the chamber of the people, and the Senate is the chamber that's supposed to protect us from the tyranny of the people. Now, whether they're effective uh, at doing that today is debatable. Um, the Texas legislature, like I said, is small when you compare it uh, to the size of the state. But because of our government culture here in Texas, we tend to believe smaller government is better. So uh, there, has a not, there has not been a rush to make our legislature any bigger. Um, we also have one of the shortest legislative sessions of all 50 states. Um, the Texas legislature only meets biennially, meaning they meet every other year <clears throat> in odd numbered years. So they are in session right now and they only meet for 140 days. Now, the that session can be extended if the governor chooses to do so, but a normal legislative session is 140 days every other year. Now, this has its roots in tradition. You know, if you think about the 19th century, early 20th century before cars and things like that, um, many of our representatives had to travel to Austin to represent their districts. And so you can imagine traveling from El Paso to Austin uh, by horse and carriage or by horse. Um, that took a while. And so most of our representatives have to maintain their other employment uh, in addition to their responsibilities as legislators. As legislators. So uh, that's part of the reason why we have the biennial session and why it is short, because our legislators have to get back to work and whatever it is that they do. Um, the legislature must close its session uh, at 140 days. This rule is known as sign die, um, unless <clears throat> there's two exceptions here. Uh, one is what we call an extraordinary session. So let's say that uh, outside of that 140 days, something drastic happens. And we've been dealing with drastic things for the past couple of years now. So if we say had another freak snowstorm or the pandemic or, you know, a riot or something like that, and it happened outside those those 140 days, uh, the full legislature could be called back into session to deal with those specific issues. The other instance is the special session. <clears throat> this is a power given to the governor to extend the legislative session uh, in 30 day increments. And the governor gets to set the agenda when they extend the session by special session. So the governor can say, so let's say, you know, we, we've just dealt with, you know, the, the big snowstorm, uh, you know, we've got issues with our power grid and things like that. So let's say at the end of this legislative session, uh, the Congress has, or the legislature hasn't addressed that issue specifically. So the governor can call a special session and make that the only issue that can be discussed. Now, this gives the governor some power over the legislature, but the legislators are under no obligation to take up that agenda. 
So if they want to push back against the governor, they can sit there for 30 days and do nothing and force the governor to call another special session. And every time that the governor calls a special session, our legislators have to be paid more money for being there. So this can work against the, against the governor because the state doesn't like to spend money. And it can make the governor look weak if the legislature wants to defy the governor. Um, we have in the past had put it to the voters to extend the legislative session uh, from 1945 to 1975. Texas voters rejected a constitutional amendment five times to require the legislature to meet every year. So it kind of goes with our political culture. Again, we, we in Texas tend to prefer small government and you know, the less time they're in session, the less things they can mess up is kind of the attitude here in Texas. Now, the le our legislators are among the lowest paid legislators in the country. So that is why uh, we tend to refer to our uh, legislators as, citizen, as a citizen legislature. Uh, it means that they have to maintain a job or a career on top of their responsibilities as a legislator. Uh, they only make $7,200 per year that's their salary. They're given $150 per day stipend when they're in session for that 140 days. And this amounts to about $28,200 per year. So that is uh, well below the poverty level. Um, the salary of our legislators has not been increased since 1975. Uh, there have been attempts to do so, but again, this gets put to the voters and the voters reject it every time it comes up. Um, after our legislators serve 12 years, they are entitled to a retirement uh, pension, but it only amounts to about $25,760 a year. Um, so there's good and bad with this. Um, one of the good things is that it encourages legislators in our state to not stay there forever. There are some that do. Uh, but there are some that will move on to other positions, run for other elected offices, things like that. The downside is that it makes it very hard for the average citizen to run for uh, Congress in the state of Texas. Because if you're only being paid, you know, 28200 per year, uh, and you have to maintain another job, you have to think about, you know, what type of people are going to be able to do this. And this is people who are already wealthy, maybe they're CEOs, they're high paid, high powered attorneys, things like that. Um, they have the ability to support themselves and uh, run for the legislature. You know, you think about teachers, nurses, you know, very intelligent and skilled political science professors. You know, are our jobs going to give us 140 days off every other year to go be a legislator? Probably not. So it definitely kind of stacks the, the system kind of against the average citizen. Um, and then each congressperson is provided an office at the Capitol. Uh, senators are given $40,000 a month for staff. House reps are given $13,250 while in session and $12,500 when not in session. Uh, and that's not a lot of money. If you think about paying staff, you know, uh, you have to spread that amongst lots of people. And this is why, uh, you know, there are a lot of internships and things like that available for Congress, both at the state and federal level, because they don't have a ton of money to pay staff. Now, to qualify to run for Congress here in Texas, if you want to run for the Texas House of Representatives, you have to be uh, a U.S. citizen born or naturalized, uh, you have to be at least 21 years old, Texas resident for at least two years, and lived in the district that you're running to represent for at least 12 months prior to becoming a House rep. Uh, for the Senate, the requirements are just a little higher. Uh, same, you have to be a U.S. citizen, born or naturalized. Uh, you have to be at least 26 years old, uh, Texas resident for five years, and then lived in your district for at least 12 months. And it says both must be qualified voters, which means that you cannot be excluded from voting uh, for 
you know, criminal conviction uh, or any other reason that you would be excluded from exercising your right to vote. Uh, prior convictions of bribery, perjury, forgery, and other high crimes disqualify you uh, from serving because uh, these are felony convictions. Now, <clears throat> these uh, there's these are the informal qualifications. Now, our formal qualifications are in the Constitution. Our informal qualifications are looking at, you know, our legislature and what are some of the things that stand out about the people uh, in our legislature. Uh, informal qualifications, things like income. Again, most of our elected officials in the Congress, we would qualify as independently wealthy. So, um, you know, again, it makes it very hard for the average citizen to run for office in our state because they do not get paid a living wage to serve as a legislator. Education. Texas does have one of the highest educated uh, legislatures in the country, with many having uh, uh, JDs, you know, being practicing attorneys, master's degrees, and PhDs. Uh, the most common occupation of someone serving in our legislature is lawyer. Many of them uh, have a law background, have a uh, JD, that, uh, which is the degree you get to practice the law. Uh, knowledge of state politics and current events. So these are people that tend to know what's going on in our state. Communication skills, desire to serve. And then the last one is very important, the ability to raise money. Running for office has become very expensive. And so you have to be able to raise money to show the party that it's worth it to invest in you as a candidate. Now, looking at some of our demographics, these are a little bit outdated, uh, I need to update these. Uh, but in 2014, uh, and these haven't changed a lot uh, since 2014, but there have been a few fluctuations. But uh, Latinos uh, made up almost 40% of the population, but only 23% of the legislature. African Americans, 12.5% of the population, but, but only 10.7% of the legislature. Asians, 4.5% of the population, but only 1.7% of the legislature. And then white citizens make up 43.5% of the population, but 64.6% .6 in the legislature. So we're not at what we would call demographic representation. Ideally, when you're, when you're electing officials, you want them to look like the people that they're representing. But we can see that not every group is represented in the same uh, percentage as what they make up in the state of Texas. So that is changing. We are seeing more African-Americans and Latinos being elected to office in the state of Texas, uh, but it is still very lopsided because of gerrymandering, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, women. <clears throat> uh, there were only eight women in the Senate in 2014 and 28 in the House. Uh, obviously, women comprise 51% of the population nationwide. Uh, there has been an increase in women uh, serving in both the Senate and the House, but it has not been a drastic increase. Um, I'll see if I can find updated uh, demographics for you. Uh, and then, like I said, one third of all legislators are attorneys. <clears throat> Here in Texas, we have what are called single member districts, meaning that in a single district, that whole district is represented by the same person. And to win that district, the candidate needs to win a plurality of the votes, which just means they're the person who gets the most votes. Um, districts, though, because of gerrymandering, are often drawn in a way that favors uh, a certain outcome uh, for a certain party. And so uh, we've touched on gerrymandering. We'll look at it some more in some other chapters. Um, we don't use multi-member districts uh, in Texas anymore. We use them up till about 1972, which meant that large districts could have more than one representation, uh, very common for urban areas, cities, and things like that. And it definitely led to more... Um, <clears throat> it promotes domination by a majority party, which has been the Republican Party for a very long time. Um, it was contested uh, as being too discriminatory, uh, but 
Texas has implemented single member districts and instead uses gerrymandering as a way to kind of manipulate the outcome. So the ideal in the Texas Constitution is that districts should be drawn fairly. Uh, we have a legislative redistricting board uh, that is in charge of redrawing our district map every 10 years. Uh, this will be happening uh, this year. Uh, the Legislative Redistricting Board is made up of the Lieutenant Governor, the Speaker of the House, the Attorney General, Comptroller of Public Accounts, and Commissioner of the General Land Office. That group of people in the state of Texas right now are all Republican. Now, that is not representative of the demographics of the state of Texas. Texas is becoming more competitive. The blue urban areas are growing, um, but statewide offices have, are still very difficult for Democrats to win. Uh, we have not had a Democratic governor since 1992, uh, and those other positions have been pretty much controlled by Republicans since at least the beginning of the 1980s. Um, so our legislative redistricting board is definitely biased towards a particular outcome. And we are starting to see the beginnings this legislative session of the legislature making efforts to make voting harder than it than it has been in the past. And so what we're seeing is that Texas is becoming more competitive, Republican versus Democrat, and Republicans are trying to manipulate the rules a bit to hold on to power. Um, but throughout our history, power has kind of shifted. Um, in the past, it has favored the rural areas because they are so big, but we're now starting to see a shift toward urban areas because that is where population is growing the most. But what, when these districts are drawn, what will happen is they'll try and break urban districts up um, so that it dilutes the influence of groups that they don't like, uh, you know, so... One thing that's, you know, when these districts are drawn, they're supposed to be drawn without racial bias, but they can be drawn based on party affiliation. Now, what's difficult about that is there's a heavy correlation between uh, racial and ethnic identity and party affiliation. We know that African Americans and to a degree Latinos tend to side with the Democratic Party more often, and still a majority of white citizens in our state identify as Republicans. So it is very difficult to draw these districts in a way that is not biased against a particular group. Um, law states that districts should be roughly equal in population, that a particular representative or senator should be representing the same amount of people. But our map has been found to be very problematic in the past. Texas's maps, our district maps, have been challenged at the Supreme Court uh, for probably the past 30, uh, 30 to 40 years. Each, every 10 years after we do the census, we redraw the map. Uh, and throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century, our map has been one of the ones that is challenged consistently in the Supreme Court for being racially biased. Now, what does it take to get elected in the state of Texas? <clears throat> um, running for office is very expensive. So uh, to run for, say, Texas Senate, the average candidate spends about $150,000 to run for office. Most of us do not have that kind of money just laying around to spend on an election. So <clears throat> the candidates get support from a lot of different entities, whether it's lobbyists and interest groups, political action committees that raise money, the candidate themselves raise money. And then if the party believes that that candidate has a viable chance of winning, then that's who the party will invest their money in as well. Um, but it, it is very expensive to run for office and it has continued to get more and more expensive each election. Um, <clears throat> Also, we have in Texas non-competitive districts. These are districts where uh, one party has such a strong representation that uh, they are easily going to win the election. So where I'm from, I'm from East Texas. It's very uh, rural, very country. Uh, in my home county, 
there's very little chance of a Democrat winning uh, the House or the Senate from my hometown. Now, if you look at Dallas or Houston or Austin, it's a very different story. There's probably districts where it is almost impossible for a Republican to win. Uh, we call these non-competitive districts. And so sometimes in, in those types of districts, you won't even see someone from the other party running for office because they know it's just not uh, it's not viable. And so they won't uh, spend the money there. They'll invest the money in candidates in more competitive districts. Um, after party affiliation, race is the second biggest factor that determines the way a district votes in Texas. And it makes sense because, you know, our elected officials are supposed to represent us. We want to see people who look like us representing our interest. Um, so party first, you know, because that represents your ideology. And then second, you know, if you're from a majority uh, Latino district or African American district, chances are your representative is going to be of that race as well because you want to make sure that your community's interests are being represented uh, in the legislature. Um, in Texas, we do not have term limits, so people can run uh, for the same position, uh, at least in the legislature, the House and the Senate, they can run for the same position as many times as they want. Uh, most often, though, uh, we see high turnover in Texas, again, because our legislators are not paid very well. Many of them will use it as like a stepping stone to a bigger office. Maybe from there, they'll run for attorney general or governor or something like that, or run for the federal house or the federal Senate. So uh, a lot of people don't stay in the Texas legislature long. It it does become like a stepping, step, stepping uh, stone to like a higher position. Leadership in the legislature. Uh, <clears throat> Bonin is not our Speaker of the House anymore. Uh, I forget who won the election this year. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you who the Speaker of the House is, uh, but I will ask you what they do. So uh, don't worry about who the Speaker of the House is. Um, it's not important. Just know what their responsibilities are. Uh, the Speaker of the House is elected at the beginning of each legislative session. Um, they assign committee members to their committees so they can wield that power to reward or punish supporters by giving them their, their choice committee assignments. Uh, they put bills on the calendar. The way our legislature works, you know, a bill goes on a calendar and it can be discussed for that day. And then when we move on to the next day, we have to discuss what's on that day's calendar. So that's a lot of power. And you get to decide the order that those bills will be discussed in. Uh, decide how to how, uh, how the process and procedure will work in the House. What are the rules? How are we going to enforce the rules? Those kind of things. And then, of course, the Speaker of the House recognizes people uh, to speak. The leadership in the Senate, uh, the Senate is overseen by the Lieutenant Governor. And so this is one of the reasons why the Lieutenant Governor is considered the most powerful politician in Texas. The Lieutenant Governor is essentially part of two branches of government. They're part of the executive branch. They have their role as essentially vice governor. They will take over if something happens with the governor. Uh, they uh, have the influence of being lieutenant governor and setting an agenda and things like that. But then they get to essentially implement that agenda in the Senate because their role is just like the Speaker of the House. So in the Senate, the lieutenant governor gets to assign committee members, assign bills to the calendar, and decide on the process and procedure and recognize people to speak. So, um, and then of course the uh, governor can appoint people to different, uh, the lieutenant governor can appoint people to different boards and things like that outside of the legislature. So the lieutenant governor is actually probably the most powerful person in Texas. The governor has limited powers, and we'll talk about that in the executive branch section. Committees, I don't want you to get too bogged down in committees too much. There's just a few things to, to think about here. Standing committees are permanent committees. Uh, conference committees are made up of members of both the House and the Senate. They essentially work out differences between the bills that are passed before they go to the governor. 
Interim committees are temporary and they're set up to study specific issues. So like right now, I'm sure we have an interim committee for the pandemic, an interim committee uh, for the power grid situation, you know, things like that. <clears throat> Basically, bills go through their related committees first and if they make it out of the committee, then they'll be voted on by the whole Senate or the whole House. So in committee, they'll read a piece of legislation, they'll read a bill, uh, debate it, make amendments to it where they handwrite changes. Um, then if the bill makes it out of committee, it goes to the floor, it's read again with the changes included, the whole Senate and the whole House debate. Then the third reading is when members vote on a bill. If a bill is approved by one House of Congress, it has to go to the conference committee so that the House and the Senate can work out the differences because identical bills have to be sent to the governor for signature. There can be no differences between those versions. Uh, conference committee is just made up of five members of each uh, chamber. Um, and they, like we said, they resolve the differences between bills. So these are the three functions of the legislature. They make laws. Uh, that is pretty much their primary goal. Uh, general law is law that affects the whole state. Local law affects how local government can operate. And then special law has to do with exemptions and things like that. Uh, they also handle budget and taxation. So the most important thing that happens every session is a budget must be passed or the state shuts down because nothing gets funded. Um, so a budget must be passed every legislative session. If at 140 days, there is no budget, then they have to extend the legislative session. Uh, and then their third responsibility is oversight. This is where they create rules for other government agencies. Uh, dictate how they're going to operate and close down unnecessary government agencies to save money and things like that. <clears throat> um, a few uh, terms here having to do with the legislative process. Riders are provisions that get attached to bills. Um, kind of, These are essentially amendments that sometimes they don't have anything to do with the bill itself and can make passing legislation very difficult. So let's say that we have a bill and we're trying to increase funding for um, education in the state of Texas, but somebody attaches a rider to it to allocate uh, $3 million to building a bridge in Dallas. Well, a lot of people may support the education bill, but they don't want to spend $3 million on this bridge. So sometimes those amendments can be voted off of the bill but sometimes they get snuck in and it makes it hard for people to vote for the whole bill because all of these riders have been attached to it wanting money for this, that, and the other. Uh, a closed rider is a provision attached to a spending bill uh, that are not made public until the conference committee reviews the bill. So this means that uh, the public doesn't know about these riders until the conference committee starts debating on whether they should be included or not. The calendar we talked about, a bill has to be on the calendar to be considered uh, for debate. Um, some non-controversial bills may be passed by committees, um, but major bills have to go to the whole House and the whole Senate. In Texas, 80% of all bills are passed in the last two weeks of the session. They spend most of the time debating and arguing over the substance of the bills. They'll get them ready, and then at the end of the session, just vote for all the ones that they have enough support for. This, I'll let you read on your own. These are a lot of different tactics they use in the, the, um, the Congress for the process of dealing with bills, you know, either trying to speed them up, slow them down, and things like that. The most popular one, or the most well-known, is the filibuster, uh, but you can look over these yourself. And then this is just another slide about demographic representation, so I won't go into this because we've already discussed it, but it does talk about how, um, you know, districts are drawn in a way to marginalize certain populations and their influence. Um, you know, we're thinking about, like, if we're looking at uh, 
you know, women and uh, women and men in, in uh, Congress, you know, women represent 51% of the state, but only account for 20% of the legislature. And many women that serve in our legislature report that they are bullied and harassed and things like that. Um, you look at African Americans, we only first elected the first African American representative in 1966. Um, you know, so this is probably where we'll see the most change uh, in our government over the next few years. Uh, some of these uh, percentages are increasing. Um, religion is probably one of the few that doesn't change that much. Uh, only 3% of the legislature reports being Jewish, 7% 7 report, 7 reports other, and 90% report they, that they are of the Christian faith. So we know that that, that um, traditional values, you know, i.e. Christian values, is a huge part of kind of the Texas political conversation. But that is changing. A lot of these demographics are changing. And like I said, I'll try and find updated uh, demographics for you all if I can. Uh, but that's all for the legislative session. Uh, if you have any other questions, obviously email me or we can talk about it uh, during the Q&A.